Last week we went over a few JRPGs that I wouldn't recommend to a newcomer, and this week we're flipping the script. Here are 7 JRPGs that I would recommend to any newcomer. And we're starting with a game that I'd like to think many veteran JRPG players would instantly think of when recommending a game to someone who has no background with the genre. Super Mario RPG, specifically the remake from last year. There is no reason why this doesn't fit the bill. It's rooted in familiarity with arguably the most recognisable gaming mascot ever conceived. It's vibrant, it's funny, and it's very inviting gameplay-wise. It's easy to grasp from the off. Despite being a classic turn-based experience, Super Mario RPG, I feel at least, bridges the gap between the familiar platforming roots of the franchise and the offerings of a standard JRPG experience. It combines the RPG and platforming genres beautifully. It's seamless, both on the overworld and the combat itself. Even for someone like me who has played over a hundred of these games, it was one of the most memorable experiences I had in 2023. I was smiling and laughing at nearly everything happening. It was absurd, it was manic, but it is Mario. You don't go into a Mario game expecting tear-jerker narratives or deep themes. Mini games are going to pop up frequently, but they're never forced or contrived. They always flow directly into the makeup of the journey itself, and some cutscenes will play on the excellent sound design to create a sort of interactive moment in the story that just oozes charm. The characters are brilliant, familiar yet wonderful designs for the returning cast, charming appearances for the new entries, and dialogue that is very simple but very impactful at the same time. Super Mario RPG had a tone in mind when these characters were written, and everything you see on screen is tailored to fit that atmosphere. It helps as well that the game is fairly short, around 15 hours for a standard playthrough, if that, and it never gets boring during that runtime. I can't sing its praises enough, Super Mario RPG was a triumph when it first released, and this remake just solidifies that status. A game I would recommend to any newcomer. The second game on the list though, I am a little apprehensive about recommending, but I can't deny that it ticks a lot of boxes. It's the original Blue Reflection. The reason I am more on the fence with this one is that I know Blue Reflection will not be for everyone. It's a lot more melancholic, it has undeniable fan service at certain points, and it is rough in places. But I'm leaning more in favour of it because Blue Reflection does a lot of great things. At the very least, it forms the foundation of its much stronger sequel in Second Light, so if this catches a new player, they can immediately jump into the next one. And it is quite a simple game all said and done. Joining high school students Yuzu, Lime and Hinako, Blue Reflection is centred around the aftermath of an accident that Hinako experienced that forced her to quit her promising ballet career. It's a more character-focused journey, especially in regards to the growth of her as the protagonist, looking at how she interacts with others in lieu of that experience and how she uses her powers as a reflector to help others. The charm of Blue Reflection is that everything combines into a laid-back atmosphere that persists right till the end of the game and I'm certain that part of that boils down to the game being very easy, and that you would have to actively try and lose during battle. There is no traditional levelling up here. Instead, as Hinako, Yuzu and Lime help other students, they are rewarded with fragments, which then allow them to allocate points to certain parameters. And they also double as a form of equipment to boost the effectiveness of abilities. The thing is though, is that if you spend ample time doing the side quests and optional events, you'll be far ahead of the curve in terms of where the main story expects you to be. And even if you were at parity, it's still very much on the easier side of the spectrum. This isn't a game that is designed to be stressful, it's all about the journey this time around, the growth of Hinako and the characters around her, a conscious design choice by producer Junzo Hosoi while developing the game. It's a game of relationships and acceptance, and thus it's meant to be more low-key in nature. Plus, I feel that Blue Reflection also champions another often overlooked aspect of JRPGs. While the game itself is a relaxing experience overall, it is certainly supported by its whimsical and quite frankly beautiful OST, one of my favourites in recent memory. If you place value on music, Blue Reflection has you covered there. The third spot is reserved for Dragon Quest XI Echoes of Elusive Age. There was no way it was not getting on here, and it gives me another chance to share one of my favourite moments in Smash history. Let this man state what he did. Yo! Yo, hero, nice! <laughs> I outplayed that, man. Who's mad? Dragon Quest XI is more a love letter to the older style of JRPG, while refining that formula to bring it to the present age. It is undeniably well put together on the surface, you immediately notice the care and polish in every facet of the game. 
There is nary a blemish on the canvas that makes up DQ11. It's a very clean game on the surface, and thus its first impression is near on always positive. It's got a wide open world with plenty of secrets and side content sprinkled throughout. It's the encapsulation of a feel good adventure, starting from your village and eventually realising your fated destiny so it has a decent flow to it throughout as well. And the gameplay, much like Super Mario RPG, easy to grasp. A by the numbers turn based system that doesn't have much in the way of bells and whistles attached to it. Characters provide added diversity, but it's otherwise a solid foundation to work with. The OST is not one of my favourites, I will admit as much, even the refined renditions for later releases weren't to my tastes, but it can't be perfect in every area. Despite that though, I can't deny that DQ11 ticks a lot of boxes for newcomers to the genre, and I dare say many looking for a JRPG to start with will see past the OST. And if you manage to do that, then you've pretty much got a game that excels near on everywhere else, so I can't justifiably omit it as a recommendation. And much like Dragon Quest XI, I cannot put a list together like this without giving mention to Monolith Soft's masterpiece in Xenoblade Chronicles, the definitive version in this case for Switch. Xenoblade Chronicles, just like any other excellent JRPG, encompasses so much of what makes the genre special. The captivating world, the deep and thought-provoking characters, a real desire to create a cinematic experience that does deliver in many cases, and a very memorable story all said and done. Xenoblade Chronicles has so many moments within it that I still remember to this day. It's undoubtedly one of my favourite narratives in gaming, and that extends to the full trilogy too. But even if story isn't your thing, I think this game offers far more than just that that can hook a new player in, without being too complicated to grasp. You have seamless transitions into this MMO-style combat, a wide array of arts along with customization potential plus the ability to move freely while in combat. And these arts also have directional effects as well. Each character has a unique playstyle, so you're bound to find the lead that works for you. There's plenty for you to learn if you want a different change of pace. With this gameplay, you will really be feeling it. As for the situation outside of combat, wide open planes that admittedly can feel a little empty, but I think it fits the theme of the game when you consider what you're actually walking on. At the end of the day, you're making your way up a titan in the Bionis while gazing at the imposing Mechonis in the distance. Its stature alone not only acts as a marker on where you are on the Bionis itself, but also reminds you constantly of the scale of the world you're in. It lends well to the atmosphere. The only downside in this case is that the game is Switch exclusive, but I'd like to think a lot of players nowadays have a Switch on hand, and as a JRPG fan, it's a no-brainer for some of the exclusives on the platform. This one is yet another easy recommendation for the Switch if you have one, whether you care about story or not. But if you do care about story, I cannot in good faith not recommend the Trails game, and I'm gonna go with the first Trails of Cold Steel. Even if a new player isn't inclined to check out the other games, I still think Cold Steel 1 is a brilliant standalone JRPG anyway that shows what the genre is all about. This is the one though that got me into the Trail series. This channel was birthed off of my experience from this game and it formed the foundation of my eventual love for the series as a whole. Cold Steel was the perfect tonic to reinforce to me the magic of JRPGs and what they can achieve. It is a slower game for all intents in terms of pacing, but it's the world building that really props up not only Cold Steel, but the Trails series as a whole. It may have slow pacing, but that doesn't make it bad, because everything is set up so meticulously to bring the journey to life. Players join Class 7 at Force Military Academy in the Erebonian Empire, and start to unearth the problems surrounding this land over several chapters. Of course I am going to say that the story didn't disappoint, as it opened the door down the rabbit hole to the rest of the games, but it's still one of my favourite narratives in JRPGs, so it has my endorsement. Add on to that the staples of the Trails games, like satisfying turn-based combat, utilising arts and crafts, amazing music, a real sense of scale in the world, and a great cast of characters. All of these together, in a bubble, easily elevate Cold Steel to at least a recommendation from me. But the main reason I recommend this game is tied more to the deeper implications which we mentioned earlier. Cold Steel can easily act as a gateway into something far bigger than a player would first realise, an interconnected series of games that is quite simply unrivaled and will likely never be replicated. It's no exaggeration to say that if you get hooked on trails, you are sticking around for the long haul. You 
become attached to this world and the characters within it. Heck, even NPCs have their own stories moving from game to game. And it's never been a better time to get involved. All the games up till the 11th title, Trails Through Daybreak, are available on some modern platforms at least, and it looks like the gap is ever so slowly closing to be in line with the Japanese releases, with Daybreak 2 releasing early 2025. I don't think some people realise how close Trails was to never coming west at all, so this is a time of celebration for a fan like myself, and developments like that make the Trails series ever more easy to recommend. And it stands to reason that after recommending one of my favourite story-based JRPGs, we jump to one that is absolutely horrible on that front in Fire Emblem Engage. My thoughts on the story of Engage, I've been pretty open about it from the day I played it, and I'll continue to stick by that opinion. It has moments, but as a whole, pretty bad. So why do I recommend this to a newcomer? Well, first of all, some players don't place much importance on story. And secondly, its gameplay has to be one of, if not the best iteration we've seen thus far in the Fire Emblem franchise. The strategic gameplay used is addicting as all heck when you first get stuck into it, and engages is at the peak in my eyes. The use of additional attacks and the ability to disarm opponents to prevent them from retaliating just adds yet more to the strategic foundation that makes up this series. But what allows it to stand above the rest is the use of the emblems, which are vessels that hold the spirits of recognisable heroes from the previous games. It's a star-studded roster as well, so if anything it could even incentivise players to check out the older games if they find themselves curious. In truth though, the emblems are such a good addition, each with their own skills, abilities, and they can be equipped to pretty much anyone, so you can play however you want. There's a staggering amount of flexibility on offer, and you'll be able to experiment with emblem pairings throughout the playthrough. All the characters show up during your periods of downtime between missions too, as do the emblems, and this is where you also get to see the optional support interactions, which are actually quite enjoyable in this game. I got a kick out of characters like Icon Goldmary. There's plenty to appeal to all tastes here. Once again, I don't recommend Fire Emblem Engage for its story, I recommend it for its gameplay, which it nails in many respects. And it's easily found nowadays, being the most recent release in the franchise, anyone can find it online or at a second-hand game store. And the final game for this list will be a jump back to 1995, but a game that has endured those years, aging better than many in the process, it's Chrono Trigger. Chrono Trigger is pretty much the quintessential JRPG experience, and this is coming from someone who often prefers modern titles. I'm playing through a lot of retro games as we speak as part of a Patreon series, but none of them, from the ones I've played at least, have aged as well as Chrono Trigger. I was astounded at how well it held up. I said it there, and I'll say it here. If Chrono Trigger released in 2024 instead of 1995, it would still be one of the best games to release this year, such is its everlasting quality. From its story to its characters, its OST, the gameplay, there is very little you could point out that takes away from the experience. And it caters to not only a beginner, but also a veteran, with its multiple ways to pursue the ending. It gives optional challenges, it pioneered the concept of New Game Plus, and it's a notably short game at around 15 hours for a standard playthrough. But what Chrono Trigger does so well is that it packs those hours with meaningful and engaging content. Nothing is wasted, there is no unnecessary bloat in this game. Chrono Trigger isn't merely a great RPG, rather it is the definition of what a great JRPG is. It is the mould and the foundation that all other games follow to achieve a legacy of their own. Pretty much everything within the game is what the genre is known for, and it excels in every single one, and of course, we can't leave out its iconic art style courtesy of the late great Akira Toriyama. It has been 30 years and still Chrono Trigger is one of the finest works ever made, ultimately encapsulating the definition of what makes a memorable JRPG. And 30 years later, I am certain it will still hold that same legacy. It is an easy recommendation to any newcomer interested in JRPGs. Thank you for watching this video. If you liked it, please like and subscribe for more JRPG content and consider joining my Patreon if you're interested. Peace.